Thanks much. Uh, thanks again uh, to the, uh, to the uh, chairman for inviting me to talk. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit. I've been asked to talk to you about my personal journal, journey towards a medial stabilized knee. Uh, my disclosures haven't changed since the last talk. Um, I really should have named this the 20% 20, 20 dissatisfied total knee surgeon because uh, that's what I was before I met uh, the medial stabilized knee. Uh, if I'm going to tell you a little bit of my journey, I'll start, I'll, uh, start from the very beginning. Um, I was raised in uh, western Massachusetts, two, uh, over two hours west of Boston. This is the same street in, I don't remember when the camera was invented, but sometime a long time ago. Um, uh, the town is 250 years old and not a lot's changed. Uh, but my journey through knee replacements has changed an awful lot. Um, I did my medical school at Georgetown where uh, all I saw was PS knees, and I thought it was a pretty simple operation, frankly. I watched uh, a chief resident and an attending faculty uh, make an arthrotomy, put a couple of jigs on, make some cuts, cement something in place, and it, that was it. Every single time. Yeah, I thought it was a repeatable and reliable operation. Now I know, now I know different. Um, University of Chicago for residency, I saw all sorts of things, but mostly PS knees. Uh, all J-curve knees, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, I saw a lot of AGCs, that's the picture in the top right, universal femurs, J-curves with a uh, metal back monoblock tibia. I saw single radius designs, again PS, that's the bottom right, uh, where you had a single radius device. I even saw dual radius devices, that poly that you see there, that is a, a transitional guided motion total knee with a PS post, uh, where once you get to about 60 degrees of flexion, you transition to a different radius of curvature on the femur. Uh, in fellowship, I saw my first real CR exposure. That's actually an x-ray from my fellowship. Uh, four peg tibia um, uh, and a round, uh, sorry, J-curve on flat poly. So a little bit of everything. And my training was confusing. Um, but uh, my mentors did a good enough job and helped me understand their, their lines of thought so I could follow the different strategies. But I was exposed to posterior referencing, anterior referencing, anterior rough cut on the femur first. Uh, doing distal femur first, tibia first, gap balancing, plus or minus a tensioner, measured resection with ligament releases, you name it. Um, by the time I started my practice in 2003, I did what most young surgeons do. I did what I was most recently taught to do, which was what I did in fellowship. I did a CR knee, uh, J-curve on flat poly, four peg tibia, cemented. I resurfaced all the patellas. I did the femur first with an anterior referencing technique and an anterior rough cut. And I did uh, measured resection with tissue releases. I can tell you there's only one thing on that slide that I still do, and that's I cement all my implants. The rest of it, it's all different. All right, so unlike the town I grew up in, there's a lot of change. Uh, being in Chicago, the epicenter of the MIS uh, experience, uh, craze if you want to call it, uh, early on in my career, uh, I was exposed to all of these things. Small incisions, small instruments, small implants, high flexion implants, gender specific implants, all of which have been shown to contribute absolutely nothing to arthroplasty. Um, the only thing that it brought forward was a couple of recalled tibial implants, but really no change in outcomes. I did learn how to handle the tissues a little bit better. I did learn a little bit about pain management, but I learned nothing really about knee implants and knee design. I showed you this video earlier. I hope you all leave this, uh, leave this symposium over the next couple of days and you remember what instability really looks like. Um, kind of six, seven years into my career, I was struggling with laxity. I was unhappy with what I had to use. I had gone back to PS implants. I was starting to use a PS implant where the post was a little more posterior, so I got a little earlier engagement of the cam post mechanism. The poly was a little more dished to try and give me a little more anterior po posterior support. I even toyed around with slightly larger posts, none of which really made me anything other than what I was already at, the 20% dissatisfied surgeon. Uh, so I started to look a little more into what I was actually doing. I was probably seven years into my career, and I really didn't understand what a J-curve was on a femur. This is actually a picture from uh, an original patent submission for a J-curve uh, J, J femur design. Um, and a J-curve is a plurality of distinct radii with centers arranged along an arcuate path with successively larger radi radii serial arranged from posterior to anterior. Figure two, that's figure two. 
the picture in words is figure two. Figure three is what really most J-curve implants are, and you see there's really only three centers of radii. The rotational center displaces sharply as you go from one to two to three on those individual radii on figure three, and that leads to distinct areas of instability on that femur. Couple that with a J-curve on flat poly, and you're really asking for nothing other than some form of instability. So by 2010, I'm truly the dissatisfied surgeon. I'm still looking for something, and I happen along uh, the medial stabilized total knee. Uh, I cautiously adopted it. I used it only uh, in mild varus total knees because I wasn't really sure what I was doing. Um, I did my surgical technique at, at that time had, had evolved into a hybrid of gap balancing and measured resection with a little bit of tissue releasing, really a PS technique. And what I did was I would do my surgical technique, I'd place a PS implant or trial, and I'd do my exam. Uh, and then I would remove that PS trial and put the medial stabilized trial in place and repeat the exam. And what I, what I, what I learned was that I could get improved stability without compromising my surgical technique or changing it. Uh, so then I, and then I was kind of off to the races. Um, I began to increase my utilization of medial stabilized knees, but was still somewhat cautious until I was fortunate enough to be invited to a small meeting in 2015 of about 30 people in London where I got to sit and uh, do a lot of listening, not a lot of talking, but a lot of listening to Dr. Freeman and uh, Vince, uh, Pinskarova, and they challenged me on my understanding of what I was doing, uh, and that led me towards uh, this study, which I referenced earlier, but this study really called um, out to me a couple of things. Engineers define balance as the displacement for any given force at the joint, varus and valgus identical at any degree of flexion, and similarly the tension in the tissues at any degree of flexion is the same for that given force. And that's not really the normal knee. So balance as it's described in the engineering literature right, is really not what I was looking for. So when we did this study, we looked at cadaveric knees, 20 of them, and then and we, with custom navigation, give a, gave a given force, varus valgus and AP, throughout various ranges of motion in the pre-surgical state and the posterior, sorry, in the post-surgical state, which was a medial stabilized total knee. And what we found was the varus valgus stability, redefined now, right, a little bit different medial lateral, was the same in the native state and the, re and the reconstructed state throughout mid-flexion, and the AP stability was the same as well. So then I was kind of really off to the races. This is something I, I always want to use. Uh, and I referenced this clinically. Um, this, to call the details of it, we found indeed more stability in mid-flexion, but the key is that we had a, uh, an experienced KT1000 user who had published several studies using it, uh, who was blinded to the implant, uh, and I was blinded to the outcomes until we did the stats and kind of looked at it. So the mid-flexion AP stability was, uh, was real, and there's a clear difference between the medial stabilized knee and the PSD. And all this did was reinforce my casual observation that my patients were doing better. So what do I do now? So I've always had an interesting practice in that 40% of my knees are valgus. It's an enormously high number. My fellows come and they're like, where do these people come from? Um, but I do medial stabilized total knees for all of them, irrespective of the magnitude of valgus. Um, I do both mechanical and kinematic alignment, but when I do kinematic alignment, uh, I view kinematic alignment, and this is my personal opinion, this is not, this is not born in fact, but it, it seems to, be, to me to be very much like a uni, to have an ideal indication where you don't, you don't variate very too far from the norm. You maintain your adduction moments somewhere in the range of normal. Your implants are not in 10 degrees outlier status. And I think in that setting, kinematic alignment's a wonderful operation, but I use custom guides to do that so I can identify whether or not that's going to be the case pre-surgically. I otherwise use traditional instrumentation. I don't use navigation or, uh, and, I don't use, um, and I don't use robots. I don't resurface any of my patellae. Uh, and I'll tell you, you should see soon, there's a manuscript coming out where we have uh, looked at unresurfaced patella with a medial stabilized total knee. And the key, the key variable is that the trochlear groove is a single radius, right? So there's predicate literature that says an unresurfaced patella with a lateral facetectomy with a single radius trochlear groove at 10 years 
has the same, has the same incidence of anterior knee pain, whether you resurface the patella or not. Um, and I have a very targeted physical examination. Dr. Blaha was asking me a little bit about, about this uh, after the last session. My targeted physical exam for me means I have defined expectations of what this thing should look like when I'm done. So in terminal extension, it should be rock solid, stable to varus valgus stress. I should have good bearing congruence in the tissues and the bearing congruence are not asking for different things. I have an, and I have a neutral alignment. In early mid flexion, that knee opens up. The lateral side may open up more than the medial side, but it does open up. But at, but at mid flexion, about 45 degrees, that varus valgus laxity is gone. Uh, at 90 degrees, the patella tracks. I have good tension in the extensor mechanism. It's not, it's not tight. Uh, I, have, I, I have lateral sided rollback with the medial dwell point uh, that is fixed. Uh, and the AP shuck at 90 degrees in an open chain setting is five millimeters or less than I have, and then further passive flexion beyond that. So now I'm the satisfied total knee, uh, total knee surgeon and uh, happy to hear questions afterwards. Thanks much.